unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. We'll open our Bibles to the second book of Peter, the first chapter, the 20th verse. Second Peter, chapter 1, verses I will read from the Amplified Version. Now the Bible says, Yet first, yet first, I have shared severally that there are things that are emphasized in Scripture for the contemplative learner, for someone who does not just seek to understand the surface of things, but seeks to go deep into the understanding of the things that are behind certain things. And in such things, we seek to define a particular order in the way of the Spirit, in the interpretation and prediction of the things that touch divine purpose. And I have said once or twice that there are things that come before others. And these things, by reality, are foundationals. And these touch for wisdom. Why? Because wisdom is a principal thing. It is what comes, then understanding, then knowledge. That's the order. With wisdom, a house is built. With understanding, a house is established. And with knowledge, the house is filled with all precious and pleasant riches. And so, when we talk about wisdom, we talk about foundational things into the understanding, into the knowledge of things. So you cannot claim a knowledge of things that you carry no understanding of, and you cannot claim an understanding of things that you carry no wisdom of. So wisdom is a principal thing. And because of what is happening in this hour, and the things that I've heard in my spirit as God is preparing us for the next move of the spirit, I feel in my heart that I'm going to take a long time of my ministry touching many things that are foundational because we have had a very big challenge on some of the foundations that have been built in the name of the gospel. And those of you who read understand what I mean. And if I had time just to talk about foundations, you will understand why ministries are failing and with that families are failing, you know, Businesses are failing, careers are failing, especially if we're talking about the church. The influence is sort of decimating in some spaces, of course. That cannot be for the holistic part of the body of Christ. But by and large, if you hear churches are being closed, for example, in Europe, and spaces where men used to converge to worship are now cinemas, and restaurants and hospitals. That is speaking a lot. And yet, they have a long history. They've had the faith for quite a long time than we do carry here in Africa. But that's how it has happened. You know, that's how history has spoken. Well, if you go through church history and study Rome, the Roman Empire, you know, the age of the Christendom, then you transition into how the gospel floods the whole of Europe and then from Europe crosses over to the United States. It's almost as though wherever the flame has expanded, sort of because certain things are not held, you know, in clarity and certain foundations are not, not clearly drawn in the faith, it's almost as though the old parts are getting coagulated, they are getting frustrated, and every other day, the generals are disappearing, you know, especially from where the gospel came from to where it's moving right now. 
And so, but it's important. The Bible says, like one man said in the scriptures, that we must learn to strengthen the things that remain. That our reward will be full. Our reward should be full as we strengthen the things that are remain, as we lose not those things which we have wrought. You know? So, much as we are speaking of the things that must be made, but we also have to bring a conversation of the keeping of the things that we have built that we receive a full reward. But only those things that touch truth, that are aligned to the truth. And of course, the breaking of the things that are not aligned to truth. So there's a lot, I believe, in the coming years of shaking. And I've spoken this for the past two, three years about the shaking that has been coming. And some of us are feeling already. We've seen it. COVID is one of them, but many other things are coming. But the shaking literally is going to be touching so much the foundations, okay? Because some foundations were not built on Christ. And so God, I believe in this time, he is taking us back to build certain foundations that will preserve the history of the church and that will keep a certain server for many generations. And I believe now this is the hour for some of us to go back again foundational. And so some things are first, okay? So when I'm speaking about 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20, it's one of those things that are first. It's one of those things that are foundational. It's one of those things that have to come before you build anything upon the gospel. These are foundational pillars. So when the Bible says, yet first you must understand this, it has to get into your space of understanding that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of any personal or private or special interpretation or loosening or solving. For prophecy, for no prophecy, ever originated because of some man willed it. Or because some man willed it. To do so, and it never came by human impulse. But men spoke from God who were born along. Born along. Right? And in the brackets there, moved and propelled. The NIV says carried by the Holy Spirit. They were carried by the Holy Spirit. So tonight, I want to explain to you what it means to be carried by the Spirit. To be carried by the power of the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be moved? To be propelled? To be carried? Well, it's one thing to lead you. And the moving, the propelling, the carrying is in the leading. But there's a specificity in this moving, in this carrying. So that's what I want to take some time to emphasize for you. So when he says that no word, no prophecy is of private interpretation, it's not existent because there was a personal or a private intention, a private deliberation, a private loosening and solving. When we study the word there for prophecy, it's the Greek word, prophetia. And it means simply, any discourse emanating from divine inspiration and the purposes of God, declaring the purposes of God. If there's any divine instruction or any divine inspiration or any discourse for any matter that is connected to divine purpose and is inspiring or aligning you to the mind of God, the revelation of God, that is prophecy. That is prophecy. It could come by, you know, the proclamation of the future, or this is going to happen. But the very spirit of revelation speaks into the future. The very spirit of revelation is an insight into the future. So when we talk about prophecy, of course, there are 12 dimensions of the prophetic. Twelve. You know, and when people are teaching about it many times, uh, it's so limited in ministry. We only know about the seers. Oh, this guy sees this. And then we say, oh, 
that's a prophet. But they have 12 realms, 12 dispensations of the prophetic. So revelation in its own instance, the spirit is an insight into the future. So it does not need to tell you your name and where you're going to go next year or tell you the name of your sister. No. Even understanding the spirit of revelation and connecting to him through the word of God, that is prophecy. In fact, the Bible calls this the sure word of prophecy, for which you do good to take heed to as a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. So, don't be so limited, myopic in understanding when it comes to the prophetic way of the Spirit. But, like I said, we're talking about any discourse emanating from divine inspiration and declaring the purposes of God. And God is saying, it cannot come by personal interpretation. It cannot come by a personal loosening. It cannot come by a personal prompting. It cannot come by a personal nudge. It cannot come by a personal intention. He says the order of the Spirit, and this is one of the first things, is that all the men of old, from the beginning of the world as God spoke in diverse manners through sundry times by the prophets and now spoken by Christ, from the beginning of the earth for any man that ever tested the person of the Holy Spirit from our father Adam, and our mother Eve, all through to the prophets Abraham, Moses, Isaac, Jacob, the Isaiahs and Ezekiahs, and all these men to the end, to the person of Christ. God gave us the formula, and he said, all of them have one distinctive mark, that they were born along by the Holy Spirit. They were moved and impelled by the Holy Spirit. They were carried by the Holy Spirit. So there is no other way we tap into the glories of the Spirit, save if we are carried. Because it's part of the ultimate definition of the leading of the Holy Spirit. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, so are they the children of God. Of course, we've seen a bunch of, you know, young upcoming ministers. Some are prophets. And you hear guys say, I'm going to walk in the Spirit now, you know. Uses the word, I am going to walk in the spirit. Can, can I enter the spirit now? Can I? You understand? I'm going to, you know. And some have even told that I go where I want. Wherever I want, I go. If I want to go to China now, I go to China now. If I want to go to Russia now, I go to Russia now. Let us examine the most imminent example in the New Testament dispensation of a man who was really carried. I'm not talking about your theatrics. I'm talking about your drama. I'm not talking about your idle imaginations and familiar spirits. No, I'm talking about real carrying. A story is given of a eunuch. Okay? And this eunuch is reading things he does not understand. What are these things? And God gets a man, and he wants to help that man to go to this eunuch and explain to him exactly what the things he's reading mean. So, when we're talking about Philip, Philip did not just wake up and he said, where can I go? Let me probably go to a certain desert. I might connect to somebody there. No, it wasn't his choice. There was a story behind a story. There was a revelation behind a revelation. There was an impulse, an impelling, a move of God behind that move that God wanted to bring salvation to a man who really needed understanding because the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. Okay? So this man is reading things that he doesn't understand. And what happens? The Bible is clear. The spirit of God carries Philip to that man. It wasn't Philip's deliberate choice to go to this eunuch. No. The Spirit carried Philip and took him to the eunuch. And the Spirit said unto him, Go near and join thyself to that chariot. You understand? 
God leads him there. And immediately does his ministry, the spirit carries and moves him. And the Bible says, and Philip was found at Azotus. He was found. The Bible doesn't say he went to Azotus. No, he was found at Azotus. As though this is a man God is carrying by the Holy Spirit deliberately for where he must be in the hour he must be to fulfill a bigger call, a bigger responsibility, a mandate. And then he preaches in all the cities until he came to Caesarea. So whatever was leading him to get to this chariot, whatever was leading and prompting him to get to this eunuch, it was divinely inspired. And he was carried in this way. You can even walk with your feet, but you're moved by the Spirit. You can disappear and appear if you have to, but you are moved by the Spirit. But also on the other side, you can move with your feet, yet not moved by the Holy Ghost. And you can be carried, you can teleport, you can have out-of-body experiences and not moved by the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is a spirit of purpose. He's not a luxury spirit. He's not a lustful spirit. No, he's a leading spirit. He's a moving spirit. And God is trying to emphasize to us that the winds that carry us are of the spirit. They are of the spirit. So, regardless of where we will be found, or we could find ourselves, we should never forget that if we are not carried there, we can, by a familiar spirit, take ourselves there. The mystery of faith is a very submitted entity to the person of the spirit. Because faith is of the spirit. And the liberties of the spirit, however available they are to us, they are still connected to the wisdom of God. And a wisdom that is patterned and principled and tells us the way of God and how things should work. Because our fear in this day and age now is not men moving in the spirit. But it is men moving in the spirit without the carrying, without being born by the spirit, without being impelled or moved by the spirit. Because for us now in this dispensation, anything that moves in the spirit, if it dresses like a minister, it's a man of God. Oh, it's a woman of God. You see? And some people may never understand this now. <laughs> because they do not understand what we are trying to heal. But one day somebody will. Because time proves all things. And they will know that we are speaking in love. Love. No anger. No jealousy. No envy. But we are entirely speaking in love. And God will judge that. But when all judgments are clear, we pray that not many are lost in understanding how this person works, the person of the Holy Spirit. How the first things come and they work. The Bible says in John chapter 3 verses 8, he says, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh. And he says, And whither it goeth, so he says, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So you ask, why do people use this scripture to mean that this is a definition of liberties in the Spirit without the birth of the Holy Spirit? There is no liberty of Spirit without the birth of the Holy Spirit. Remember, he says, so is everyone which is born of the Spirit. So he's talking about anybody born of the Spirit. He's talking about the character and nature that is attuned and submitted to the person of the Holy Spirit. Our liberties are only where the Spirit goes or blows. We blow because the Spirit blows. Our liberties of the Spirit are only available to us as the Holy Spirit ministers through us to give us the energy, the ability, the potential, the articulation, the interpretation. It's not of our private interpretation. It's not of our private solving. It's not about private loosening. You don't just wake up and say, I think let me go to Russia in the spirit. Then you close your eyes. You don't think and go. There has to be a leading behind that leading. 
There has to be an instruction behind that instruction. But you see, the lust of the flesh cannot purge men to that humility. And so two men can appear in the same place, but not of the Spirit. Not of the Spirit. When I was a young man, still trying to grow in the things of the Spirit, I love the Spirit world because it sort of opens your eyes to the many things people don't see and hear. And those that assume to see and hear, and yet they don't really hear. Because when you start to see and hear God, you're shocked at how many people actually don't hear God. And I've said that before. And so one of those days, out of immaturity, but the need to exercise myself, I found myself in a place, a certain place spiritually. My spirit was present in that particular place on a particular day. How I got there, I will not tell you how. But I got in a certain place in the spirit. And I can assure you, I wasn't led by the Spirit there. So I know what I'm talking about. And two individuals come in the Spirit. And I could see them like I'm seeing anybody. And one fellow comes in. Another fellow comes in. And they come to me to talk to me. And the Holy Spirit carried my spirit. And blocked that world in an instance, almost threw me back into my body in the sense that I cannot explain to anybody who understand. Boom! And there was a thud in my spirit. It was a very huge fear. I shook from my head to my bones. Because the power that brought me back to the present world was so scary. And in the most gentle yet stunning words he said never go where I have not led you I understood for a fact that day that any man can go in places the spirit has not led them and be not mistaken in the spirit realm because the spirit realm is not just a realm of light it's a realm of darkness too it's a realm of darkness too when Jesus goes 40 days in the wilderness, who does he encounter? Satan. He did not encounter him in the realm of light. No. He encountered Satan in the realm of darkness. How? Because Satan can only articulate the things that were articulated. Remember the Bible says he carried Jesus to a high mountain. You understand? Satan himself. The Bible says he took him up into a high mountain. It was not the Holy Spirit that carried Jesus to a high mountain. It wasn't. No, read your Bible. In Luke chapter 4 verse 5. And the devil, taking him into a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, in a twinkling of an eye. Come on. This is the Son of God, 100% God. But we see him being carried by another spirit. And he's taken to a high mountain. And he showed all the kingdoms of the world from wherever he is. Because understand the world is vast. It's hundreds and hundreds and thousands of kilometers. So there is no peak really, physical peak, from which a man can see all the kingdoms of the world. That means that Satan carried the Christ into his realm. But even when Christ was in that realm, he knew who he was. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He knew who he was. He tells him, bow to me. And I shall give you power and authority over these kingdoms. Because there's a glory to them. The magnificence and excellence of those kingdoms. Is I'll give all of them to you. The preeminence, the dignity and grace of them. For it has been turned over to me. And I'll give it to him wherever I will. And then Jesus tells him, ah. Uh -uh. Get behind me, Satan. He says, for it is written, you shall do homage to worship only God, your God, and only him shall you serve. Jesus was given a transaction preposition. And many men of God, when they get at that level, they transact. Because they don't even tell whether it's an angel of God or Satan, the angel 
that disguises himself as the angel of light. In fact, Lucifer means the illuminated one. Because for some, he has not introduced himself as Satan or Lucifer. He has introduced himself as an angel of light. And I have seen by the Spirit that some young men or women have been carried by Satan, an angel of light, and appeared in a space that appears to be light because they have not understood the distinctions between the lights. I have a summary on that, the distinctions of the lights. And then they've been given power. They've been given certain abilities in the spirit, and they come out with those abilities in the spirit and function in the church. And many people cannot tell the difference. But you can tell by the fruit. Because the fruit becomes more and more a demonstration of the flesh and the things of the flesh than the things of the spirit. Only a man of wisdom understands this. Because when you're really carried by the Holy Spirit, you will cease to be. You must decrease. And he must increase. The more you see him, the more humble you become. The more he's revealed to you, the more humble you become. The more you don't want to appear that Christ may appear. But today now, it has shifted in the church. Today, it's a show of the flesh and everything that is carnal and carries no bearing of eternal benefit. It's the things that men and women of God are boosting over that even the Arabs have. The non-believers have. Those that are of darkness have. But now it's the glory definition. The men for whom we stand as a cloud of witness, the hundreds and hundreds of men that are in the history of Christianity, I believe weep when they see our dispensation. Because these are men that were killed for this thing. They lost their wives and children for this thing. They were burnt to stake for this thing. They sold all they had for this thing. They left the most comfortable, luxurious spaces of the flesh and went in places that they could not even live and died there. Some were buried there. These men have told us that for all that was dear to them, they counted loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, for whom they have counted all things but dung that they might win him. They did not use their liberty as a cloak of malice and vice. But it was through that that they submitted themselves to count all costs to the service of Christ. Our glory is not in what we wear. Our glory is not in what we drive. Our glory is not in what we sleep in. Our glory is in the demonstration of the person of Jesus Christ to the world that is lost and dying. The souls every day that have to be redeemed and saved because Christ loves them. That's the ministry. That's the message of the hour. We should never forget that that is why we isolate ourselves. That is why we go in solitude and separate ourselves. That is why we serve God. I mean God is not going to bless you. But it's not important what I drive to the world. It's important how many souls are one. It's not important the size of my church. It's important how many in the church are going to heaven. And we must bring back those conversations again. Because we've produced a kind of very selfish Christianity. That it only comes to church for its needs, its job, its car, its money, its husband, its children, its wife, everything. It's just that. It's just needs. But you look at a believer, they've been in the church for 5, 10, 20 years, and they have never won a soul. They don't have the heart for souls. Because something in them is dead. They are carried by another light. They are carried by another light. They are carried by the lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes, the pride of life. The Bible says, those things are not of the Father, but they are of this world. How many people say, oh, I want to go to that church because that pastor dresses well. 
Oh, because he has a nice house. Oh, because he has a nice car. Oh, because he has this. Oh, because he has this. Oh, because he has that. This is not why people should come to the church. They should come to the church because we reveal Jesus Christ to them. Jesus was taken in a transaction. I later got to understand by wisdom that that day I had gone in the spirit, a transaction was going to take place. Because these individuals had come to talk to me. And I knew, I could sense in my spirit that there was a conversation they wanted to have with me. Now, you don't need to believe me. You don't have to believe me. But for those that the Lord has sent me to, I speak deeper than just what their minds can pick. They connect to something bigger. Because I would rather help a young man or a woman right now who without knowledge might find themselves in such spaces. The message was simple. Never go where I have not led you. And I learned. And from then on, I'm so careful when it comes to the things of the Spirit. When it comes to the things of the Spirit. So we can only blow, we can only go, but the real wind beneath that wing is the person of the Holy Spirit. Because we're born of the Holy Spirit. We are children of the Holy Spirit. And we cannot be separated from that nature and person in our walk and ministry. And as you continue to grow, you see the difference between the immature who could go wherever you thought you wanted to go because we're in a world that justifies all that know how to move. We're in a world that accepts all that we know how to move. If it carries the Bible and it can move, then it's of God. Jesus says something to Peter in John chapter 21, the 18th verse. He tells him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that when thou was young, when you were a babe, so it also happened to Peter, the rock, thou guardest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. If I can read it for you in the Amplified, he says, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you, when you were young, remember this is Jesus. Firstly, let me take you back a bit. Peter screwed up. Later, Jesus wants that reconciliation because he has spoken over that man's life that on that rock he shall build a church. On that rock. But on that very rock, you see that very guy deny Jesus. But anyway, later on, Jesus asks him, do you love me? Do you agape me? Yes, must I feel for you? I love you. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Feed my sheep. Now he has commissioned the minister for ministry. And at the point of that instruction, feed my sheep, that's a command. That's an imminent commissioning. The next line. Now as a minister, he says, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, when you were young, you guarded yourself. That means you put on your own belt or girdle and walked about wherever you pleased to go. That is not just physical moving. It's spiritual as well. Because when you're a babe, you go everywhere. You're just fascinated about the spirit realm. And so, because you're fascinated with the spirit realm, you want to go everywhere. You want anything that can connect you to the spirit realm because you're fascinated. But it's because a certain consciousness is not awakened in you of where you really are. That is why today men are teaching other men how to enter the spirit. Then you ask them, but if this person is born again and they are born of the spirit and they are a spirit with a soul and a body, how can you teach them to enter where they really belong? Unless otherwise, something or somebody taught them out of that realm and is trying to take them into a realm, another realm. So, he tells him, I assure you most solemnly, and I tell you when you were young, you guarded yourself, put on your own belt or girdle, and you walked about wherever you pleased to go. You went wherever you wanted to go spiritually and physically. And he says, but when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will put a girdle around you and carry you where you do not wish to go. Who is that? The person of the Holy Spirit. The person of the Holy Spirit. Even in places you do not want to go, he will take you. Oh, oh. We have gone to make peace with people we did not want to make peace with. 
we have attended to people who hurt us when we did not want to. Sometimes I wake up and I want to drive out to a place and the Spirit tells me, don't. And I don't know what to do. I just find myself in a house just staying there. Sometimes you wake up with your own personal plan and the Spirit tells you, uh uh, drive here and pack here and wait. Let's get up. But I'm enjoying my conversation. He says, uh uh, end it now. Now. Humbly, in humility. You don't even show the person. Oh, you know, yeah, sorry, but anyway, I need to run. Da 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 da. We exchange pleasantries. Bye, see you. But there's somebody who has told me, just get out now. Get out of this room now. Sometimes I've had instances where we're having a meal and then it prompts your spirit and says, we need to pray. You need to pray. And then you find yourself leaving a meal and then isolating yourself to pray. Leaving a wonderful conversation and isolating yourself to pray. Because you are carried. You're not of your own. It's not your private interpretation. You're loosening or solving no. So these liberties carry boundaries in our submission to the person of the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you something. Many years ago, it was university, I remember very well. God has revealed himself to me. I've had a carrying of the Spirit to the third dimension of the Spirit. I've seen, I've heard that day, I come back in my body, and I could not move that body for well, for at least three days. Second day, the whole second day, I was shaking. Third day, I come back to my senses. And when I started looking back through my life, I started to understand how this carrying works. And I remember when I get to the end of my university days in a vision Jesus came and he says I know that you're finishing university but there is a period that I'm introducing in your life where I will lead instruct and carry you through a certain space of ministry. And told me, as much as you're leaving university now, I'm going to take you back into university ministries. And it will have phases. I'm now in the second phase of the instruction that I received many years ago. So our ministry in university is there. We have manifest fellowships in almost every notable university in this nation. And that's thousands and thousands of people. You know? But in that first phase, I saw a period of my ministry in those universities and the instructions that came. And when those instructions came, I felt that the person of the Holy Spirit gave me a certain ability that made this way light for me. And university students started inviting me to their fellowships. But in that whole period, I had a lot of tests. I was attacked, persecuted. I was falsely accused of many things. I remember some, I even go to a point where some guy met me and said, I'm going to accuse you of this and that and that. Not because you have done it, but because you have refused to do what we want you to do. And he was a hired fellow. I mean, I have testimonies of people in this ministry that were approached to be bribed to accuse us as a ministry. But in all of those days, I could feel that caring. Because in every phase, in all change, there's that faithfulness that abides and you feel that you're not alone in this. It's not just the leading there, but it's the caring that comes with the grace that sustains your health 
with a grace that sustains your finances, with a grace that sustains the revelation, the progression of knowledge in your spirit, with a grace that sustains your prayer, with a grace that provides the right people around you to serve, with a grace that deals with the wicked, the unreasonable around you. And I could feel that I was carried in that period. That was the first time I understood what it means to be carried of the Spirit. And with every experience, God has been so clear. But it's almost as though that if you study your life, you're like a golf ball. So when a golfer has a ball and he strikes it, and it gets airborne, it's carried by the wind in air. So as long as it's in that air, it's not on its own effort. Until according to the energy, the power that is used to swing that ball, it should land in the direction, according to the energy and direction, that ball is swung. It will come at one point and land. But as it's landing, if it's not where it should be, another comes. You understand? And these speeds are defined by the direction and course these balls are supposed to go. But I've looked at my life, I've studied many in scripture, and I see that we're almost like those golf balls, that in every dispensation and season of your life, and then you're carried by the energy and the power of the Holy Spirit, and you land somewhere, and God tells you, this is the end of this stage. Are you ready? You buckle your seatbelt. Then he carries you. And then when you get to that level of your stage, and then he says, are you ready? So that whole process, as you are going to the next space, there's a strength that carries you, and that strength is established from the source, the calling, the instruction of that hour. And so... When the time comes to start for 2013, I have a very notable vision where Jesus summoned me and certain many individuals. And then he started giving us instructions. And then he equipped us in that vision. And that dream was very clear. And the moment I come out of that vision, I knew that Fanero was to begin. So by 2014, when we begin the ministry, I had felt that courage. It's one year, two, three, four. So I see. I know how long this swing is. So I am cognizant of my part in the gospel. In every aspect of my life. But when you are born by the Spirit, carried, impelled, moved by the Spirit, it is evident. It is evident. It is evident. God supplies every Thing, both physical and spiritual, to sustain that life and ministry. And the next thing I know, we put chairs, they're filled. We add chairs, they're filled. We come out of one building, it's full. It's overflowed. People faint in La Bonita for lack of space, but they keep coming. And then you see him carry you. You go into another building. A couple of months, it's full. It's overflowing. We go into another building. Uma, Maldi Baba's Hall. It's filled. It's overflowing. We go into the open area, which was filling. And so what's supposed to be planning to go to another place. But what I can tell you is, I feel that carry. I feel that moving. I feel the impelling. I feel the hand of God carry us. I feel it. So regardless of what happens, war will come, things will be stirred, tax will come left, right, and center. But God will always show you that I have carried you above all these things. They shall by no means hurt you. And we're being carried. So it's from glory to glory to glory 
And it's going to be a long carry. Long, long carry. A long one. It will outlive us. But we know that he leads us. And the more it grows, the more humble you become. Because you know it's not you. It stops to be you. Every day, you see that it's not your private interpretation. It's not your personal solving. It's not your wisdom. They were wiser men. It's not your ability. They were more able men. And it's that point when you stand on that altar. Yeah, I'll meet this, all of this. And a crippled man walks. A blind eye sees. Salvation. Homes are restored. Children are changed. They're like, wow, you're carrying us. It's the milestone. It's the many doors that are opening. TBN opened up. Faith World opened up. In Europe. Calvary. Burundi. And all of them have come. And we see they're all just connecting to a particular wind that is carrying something bigger than we are able to articulate. That is how ministry is built. That is how anything spirit-led is built. So, yes, there's a vision behind this, and a man God has ordained for this. But it's bigger than this man. That is the very reason why I don't have a Facebook page. And I'm not saying that every man with a Facebook page is wrong. I just don't think that my one individual has enough to define what's inside here. But the ministry is there. Because it's really what God is doing in me and in us. Not what we can appear. Well, yes, when Christ appears, we shall appear with him. But it's his appearance that introduces our appearance. He has the preeminence, the Bible says. So, walk out of child play. Walk out of cheap talk, chatter. Walk out of wasting time. And allow him to carry you. Allow him to carry you. Until the day you leave this world. Just allow him to carry you. Feel that carrying. Feel that aid. Feel that moving. When you're in a place where you don't feel moved, even if everything works right and the gift is justifying, unplug. And plug where you feel the spirit of God lead. And one evidence of that is you'll feel every other day incapable of self. You will understand why Paul says it's a small thing for you to judge me. For I know nothing of myself. His consciousness was so consumed that he spent and was spent for something bigger than him. For something one man could not do, but God could do through a man. Some pastors, your ministries are failing because you are the ones building that church. Jesus says on this rock, I shall build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. I, Jesus said, will build. But when a man builds, you're building your own kingdom. It cannot stand. It cannot stand. Some of you, it's not God building your marriage. It's you building your own marriage. You're the one building your own career and business. God is not carrying you. But if you're carried, if you're carried, one man sang a song and he says, all the days of my life I will follow because you've never left me alone. And the season says, you have carried me. It's a carrying of the spirit. This is foundational. These things come first. You must know. And this carrying of the spirit are the thing that I call the milestones of your destiny. And the milestones of your destiny are the moments that swing comes through. And the wings of the spirit hold you and lead you and take you. When you are led and you truly follow, you'll be amazed about how many people and how many things will follow them that believe. I want to pray with you. I feel that 
We are in a period and time in history where more than ever before, we need to break and be vulnerable for the Spirit of God to do what must be done in this hour. You don't need to explain to yourself, to anyone or anything that is made up. In fact, there was a time the Lord came to me and told me, never explain yourself again. Don't. So I don't explain myself. And neither am I interested in someone explaining for me. They don't need to. I have somebody carrying me. And that for me is sufficient. Child of God, may you be carried. In every aspect, every aspect of your life, feel the move of the spirit that is beyond your private interpretation. Beyond your own solving and ability. It's only then that you'll understand grace. It takes over your will, your ability, your potential, your plans. And the next thing you know, He controls everything. He leadeth all the way. All the way. All the way. Come and just raise your voice and pray. Raise your voice and pray. Tell him, Holy Spirit, carry me. Carry me. Carry me. Tell him, carry me. When the Spirit takes over your soul when the spirit spirit takes over your soul you will be changed his glory will be when the spirit When his power, his power takes over your soul. When his power, you will be changed. His glory will. So I pray for you that may he carry you, may he give you the wisdom to discern his move, his prompting, his impulse, his instruction, his leading, the true light. May you see yourself carried. You will produce the fruit of the glory of his person. And it shall be evident upon all that behold you that there is something different about your life. And through that carrying you will instruct. You will teach even without a sound. Because the instructions of God are vast in coming to man. The dimensions of his instruction and teaching are many. If you're sick in your body, you're healed now. If you're bound, you're free. Your family is restored. Your ministry is restored. Your children are restored. Your husband is restored. God use you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. If you're there and you've never given your life to Christ, I want to give you this, that you can only be carried by who you receive and believe. And the Bible says he loved the world so much and he gave his only begotten son. And he says, if you believe in him, you shall not perish, but have eternal life. And the spirit is life. So 
you need to receive him as your Lord and Savior. And I want to give you an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your pastor, Lord and Savior. Because this is the moment, this is the hour, this is the time. There is no other opportunity. This is the one that God has ordained for you. And so, I want to pray with you. Repeat this words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you because you died for my sins. You shed your blood for me. I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that you are Lord and born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.